needed to fly below the radar coverage. No uh, communication, no radio, no nothing. Silence, total silence. You, the aircraft and the ground flying like crazy. Israeli aircraft approached Egypt flying fast and low over the Mediterranean. 500 miles per hour at an altitude of just below 100 feet. If you are not cautious, you get very close to the water's level. And this is very, very dangerous. There is nothing in the world beside you watching the horizon, watching the direction, and that's all. All your muscles are stressed, you are in total concentration, and you don't look around. When you do this or that, that's a mistake. You might, in a split of a second, touch the water. And once you touch the water, this was it. Down you go. These calculated risks and elaborate deceptions paid off. The vital element of surprise had been kept intact until the very last moment. Shavit approached his target flying a super Mistair fighter. We are standing in front of the large air intake of the Super Mister B2, which uh, this huge intake was required to suck a lot of air into the engine when he operated the uh, afterburner. And this is the gun sight camera. No cheating anymore. This was it. Whenever you push the trigger, the camera took the picture, and this came back to the debriefings. The recent addition of the gun sight camera meant Air Force commanders could rapidly evaluate just how successful the first wave of attacks had been. Dan Severe's pilot's logbook reveals that he would fly a further two missions that day. Many pilots would complete five by nightfall on June 5th. In less than 12 hours, the Egyptian Air Force was virtually wiped out. It ended up losing 85% of the Egyptian Air Force, and that meant uh, practically that you had no air cover and that all your ground troops are bare in the desert. The Israelis are absolutely staggered by their success. They hoped they could disable the Egyptian Air Force, and at the end of the day, they had destroyed it. On top of that, hammer blows had been dealt to the air forces of both Syria and Jordan. Israel had achieved air superiority. Their ground forces could now take center stage. The focus of operations would be the Sinai Desert, where the borders of Egypt and Israel meet. A vast expanse of difficult terrain, much of it impassable sand dunes the Egyptians had constructed formidable defenses in the Sinai. A head-on clash would have been potentially disastrous for the Israelis. How could they find a way of overcoming both the Sinai's terrain and the Egyptian fortifications? Benny Mickelson has investigated Israel's strategy. They have to penetrate in between their strongholds and to reach the rear and their flanks. If the Egyptians could be struck swiftly, and from an unexpected direction, then Israel could penetrate deep into enemy territory. But the Sinai Desert's soft sand dunes presented a serious obstacle for wheeled vehicles. Yet the Israelis were able to advance relatively easily. In the early 1960s, the Israelis had conducted experiments in their own desert, the Negev. This demonstration shows the kind of tests that would have taken place. Soldiers practiced driving vehicles through soft dunes. When they got bogged down, they had to learn how to get themselves out. The problem is that because they are using wheels, the uh, contact between the wheel and the terrain is relatively low and narrow. So you have to decrease the air into the, the tires in order to have more contact between the wheel and the ground. Letting air out of the Jeep's tires gives the wheels more traction and allows the vehicle to gain enough momentum to get moving again. A simple but ingenious solution. The result was that the Israelis could advance through areas that the Egyptians least expected. But sand wasn't the only obstacle waiting for the Israelis in the Sinai.
this Egyptian tank was state-of-the-art technology in 1967. It's typical of the fearsome weaponry that faced the Israelis in the Sinai Desert. Within the space of 48 hours, hundreds of these tanks would be knocked out by Israel's much smaller forces. How was such an unlikely victory achieved? Each Israeli division that goes into the Sinai faces two Egyptian divisions. Behind those two Egyptian divisions is one more Egyptian reserve division. So that means the Israeli divisions are fighting with a three to one disadvantage. In any staff college in the world, they'll tell you, do not attack with less than a three to one advantage. Overcoming such odds would mean tackling the Sinai's intimidating terrain. Tanks may appear as though they can go anywhere in any terrain, but there's a limit to the steepness of the slopes they can climb. If the dune is more than 20 degrees on the climbing slope, so all the tanks and APCs cannot climb the dune. The Egyptians knew that in the Sinai there were dunes that were just too steep. So they arranged their defenses on the basis that an attack would come down the few roads through the desert. Benny Mickelson has discovered documents that reveal how Israel would turn this unfavorable position to their advantage. The purpose of the terrain analysis was to uh, find routes of advance in such a way that we can bypass and attack the enemy from the direction that is not expected. Mickelson has found a trafficability map, a map that shows exactly where vehicles could and could not travel. The trafficability map is a final product of long, many years of research. The important detail of this unique map of the Sinai is the distinctive form of color coding. The colors are very, very simple. The white color is trafficable, the dark color is non-trafficable. What the trafficability map reveals is that the Sinai Desert was not an insurmountable obstacle. There were a few key routes that were trafficable by military vehicles. It's very funny to say it, but because of our deep research of years, we knew the possibility to use the ground in enemy territory better than the enemy itself. Even knowing the best routes to attack the Egyptians, one thing was inevitable. It would all come down to a fierce tank battle in the Sinai. Tank historian David Fletcher has looked at the tanks the Israelis were basing their armored forces on in the early 1960s. They started off pulling stuff out of scrap yards and then started buying up from used stocks from around the world where they could. The one tank that was widely available was this late World War II model of the Sherman. Israel bought hundreds of them. By the time the Israelis are putting these things in the field in large numbers, they are actually dealing with things like the T-54 and T-55, which effectively are the next generation of tank with a far bigger and more effective gun. How could the Israelis take on the Russian-built T-54 and T-55s with what was thought to be an inferior tank? One thing the Sherman had proved during the Second World War was its adaptability. The possibility of putting an extra gun on or changing a gun, that sort of thing, was easy. And therefore, from the Israelis' point of view, it was an excellent tank to start work on. This is an M51 Super Sherman tank with a radical Israeli makeover. You cannot recognize the original one because we uh, upgrade the firepower, the protection and the mobility. We changed the caliber from the original 76 mm to 105 French gun that it allowed us to hit any target on a distance of 1,000 meter without any correction. They even modified the tracks for improved desert performance. We increased the width and we changed the material in such a way that it improved very much the trafficability. We can see also that the protection, I mean the armor, is completely new. With the revamped Sherman and modifications to other tanks in their armory, the Israelis calculated they could take on the Egyptians in the Sinai. So an Israeli tank is a souped up version of someone else's tank. It's a little bit better on the theory that if you're just a little bit better than the enemy, you're gonna win. 
Within 36 hours of the Israeli attack in the Sinai, the Egyptian armored divisions were ordered to pull back. Many Egyptian soldiers couldn't understand this decision. We felt that as an army, as a professional, we did not fight because no chance to fight. The withdrawal that took place was the worst possible you could ever imagine. If you brought a military commander and asked him to put the worst possible withdrawal plan, nothing could have been worse than this. During the retreat across the Sinai, the Egyptians suffered thousands of casualties and lost hundreds of tanks. The damage was beyond any imagination. We never thought that we could do this kind of damage. These blackened, twisted lumps of metal were once a mighty Egyptian division. What kind of power could have inflicted such all-consuming destruction? There has been speculation that Israel used a terrifying weapon, napalm. Napalm is nothing more than petrol taken into a gelled state with the addition of gelling agents to make it a bit like hair gel or grease. Okay, here we have petrol, it's in its normal state. It's very, very thin liquid, forms very, very thin droplets when there's an explosion next to it. By contrast, the napalm is much denser, and when there's an explosion next to it, it forms fairly large, dense droplets that can be thrown an awful lot further than the pure liquid, and then go and adhere to the targets. That's the theory. How do napalm and conventional gas explosives perform in practice? In this experiment, a container of gas will be detonated. Firing three, two, one, firing. The explosion dissipates in just a fraction of a second. Next, the sticky napalm. Firing in three, two, one, firing. A huge plume of fire and a much greater spread of flaming material. 30 seconds after the explosion, droplets of napalm are still burning. Napalm's greater destructive potential is clear. But how would it have been used against the Egyptians in the Sinai? On Wednesday, June the 7th, Egypt's armored divisions were retreating west towards the Suez Canal. Their routes took them through three mountain passes. In that state of panic, they were all trapped in the three passes in the Sinai and became a sitting duck for the Israeli Air Force. Complete air superiority would mean that Yellow Shavit squadron could strike the Egyptians at will. He can confirm that napalm bombs were used and to devastating effect. The napalm is a very cruel, very, very unpleasant uh, kind of a bomb. We saw like atom bomb suddenly fire. Essam Daraz was one of the Egyptian soldiers on the ground who witnessed the terrifying napalm attack. All the sky was red color. It's black and red, it is very difficult to explain. You go over the target and then you feel the wow of the fire that came up. It's frightening even to think about it now because the tank was caught in fire and the black and the black uh, smoke like like a huge chimney sucks the smoke up into the sky it's terrible hundreds of egyptian tanks and trucks were engulfed in an inferno This is film of the horrific aftermath of the napalm airstrikes. It has never been screened before.